Hi, I'm Dustin Abbott, and I'm here today to give you my review of the very inexpensive TT Artisan 50mm F2 lens. Now, this is available in a wide variety of lens mounts. I've done the review on the Sony E version. This is a full frame lens, more on that in just a moment. So, I've done it on the Sony E mount, but we've got a wide variety of other uh, available mounts, including uh, Fuji X mount, obviously an APS-C mount, uh, Canon in both an EOS M and a Canon RF mount. So you can go either direction with that, a Nikon Z or Z mount, and an M43 mount, micro four thirds. And so you can actually get this in a lot of different options. I forgot one, and that's a Leica L mount as well. And so there's a mix there of APS-C and obviously even smaller format and then full frame. I've tested it on full frame basically exclusively at this point because if, it's, if it can work on full frame, I want Wanted to test it to its full capabilities. And so we're going to take a look at the various aspects of performance. I'm going to show you a lot of photos, some really beautiful photos I've taken with this lens. And at the end of the day, it's a pretty impressive little optic for only 70 bucks and certainly at a higher degree of build than what you've seen from very inexpensive lenses in the past. This is a lens that in many ways performs a lot like a retro lens, both in strengths and weaknesses, but with the ability to maybe produce higher resolution images at the end of the day than what a lot of those older lenses are. So first of all, this is a really incredibly tiny lens. As you can see from these photos, it is 60 millimeters in diameter, but only 35 millimeters in length. So only just a little bit larger than say a pancake style lens. And it weighs in, depending on the lens mount, anywhere between 190 and 212 grams. So we'll average that out and call it 200 grams in its overall uh, weight there. So, you know, obviously very light overall, but with a little bit of heft due to the fact that this is all metal and glass. And I will note a really beautifully damped focus ring and the focus ring and the aperture ring are really the only two things that there are to talk about here. Um, while everything is nice and made out of metal, there are no electronics, there are no switches or dials or anything like that. There are just the two rings. The uh, focus ring, as noted, has really nice damping. It moves nice and smooth. It's ribbed there in metal, easy to use. And then the aperture ring up front is a clicked aperture ring and it is uh, it does have half stop detents from f2 through f5.6. After f5.6, it is only full stop detents from f8, f11, and 16, f16 at that point. All the scale and distance markings are on here. It will extend a little bit during focus, but it is minimal enough that you probably won't even notice it. Our minimum focus distance is only 50 centimeters here. The magnification is not actually listed, but I estimate it at somewhere around 0.11 or 0.12 times, so not particularly low. There are 10 uh, aperture blades in the uh, aperture iris, and so it does retain a nicely circular shape there and uh, you know performs well in that regard. Our front filter thread is 43 millimeters, and my only complaint here uh, as far as the build basics of what's here is the fact that we have a thread-on front, um, uh, front cap. I don't love these because it takes longer to take them on and off. The only upside, of course, is that they are the slimmest profile option you could have for a lens like this. There is no lens hood either included or to my knowledge available, though because it's a thread on uh, front filter thread, you could thread on any 43 millimeter threaded uh, lens hood if you so desire. The actual focus process uh, has been pretty straightforward. I mean, modern bodies obviously make focus pretty simple. About 110, 115 degrees of focus throw here, and I had no problem nailing focus in my various shots along the way. And, uh, you know, between focus peaking and then the ability to magnify an image in the viewfinder, it's pretty easy to nail focus, and the fairly short focus throw means that you can make pretty quick focus changes along the way. So not a whole lot going on there to report. Let's dive in and let's take a look at the optics and see how, well, basically what you get for 70 bucks. So we'll start our test here by taking a look at vignette and distortion. As you can see, there is some of both and vignette being the most obvious here. There is uh, some mild pincushion distortion, but it is somewhat unusually for pincushion distortion. There is a little bit of a, a wave to it there. And so as a byproduct of that, you can see my correction is not 100% perfect. And in this case, because of the nature of the lens, you're going to need to manually correct it unless someone you know develops a profile, which is not typical. Other thing that I noted is that it is can be a little bit hard to eliminate this particular vignette uh, manually for the simple reason that it's not 
linear, as you can see, it's really concentrated in the corners, so it's a little bit more complicated to correct for. So giving you a look at what I've done to correct as far as the uh, pin cushion distortion, a minus three is what I did there. And then the amount, I did a plus 58, you know, you could tweak it up a little bit higher, but you can see that even if I maximize it, it's just, it's very concentrated in the corners. And so, you know, it can over brighten in the center and, you know, and it's still leaving a little bit there. So, I mean, I just, I kind of played with a little bit of a compromise, but byproduct is, is that you're gonna have to do some work if you want to eliminate the vignette. And there are certainly situations where you're going to want to eliminate that. In this case, you can see that I did shoot essentially wide open here. You can see vignette very heavy down here in the corners. Now, oddly enough, not as heavy up here in the sky. And so uh, I have corrected on the right side. And you can see it's a much more pleasing end result after it has been corrected. Now, when it comes to chromatic aberrations, really not a terrible performance for such an inexpensive optic here. You can see that there is, in these really highly reflective surfaces, there is a little bit of purple fringing and a little bit of green fringing. Very quickly, however, we get to what is pretty neutral here in terms of the bokeh. And so, you know, really not a bad result. And certainly when viewed at a pixel level, you can see just a tiny bit of that purple fringing. Not enough here to really be destroyed to the image. Another uh, similar type shot here, but once again, you can see it's really only in these, you know, kind of the reflection of windows here, so really bright transition areas. But very quickly, we get to a, a fairly neutral bokeh, and of course, you can see the quality of the bokeh is pretty decent for such an expensive lens. Moving a little bit further away, and you can see now that the fringing is occupying fewer pixels relative to the image, and so it's at this kind of magnification, it's near impossible to see. So I wouldn't consider that to be a major issue. Now, if we take a look up here in the corners, uh, we can see that there isn't really much in terms of lateral chromatic aberrations, so no big deal there. Now, while it may hardly seem fair to put such an, an inexpensive lens on a 50 megapixel sensor, we're going to do just that. And so this is 200% magnification. This is really putting this under the magnifying glass. You can see in the center of the frame, it passes with flying colors. A good amount of uh, contrast and detail there. Mid frame also looks surprisingly good. And you can see as we kind of pan down here, everything is looking quite good until you get towards the corner. And down up in this level, not bad, though contrast is dropping. You can see as we get towards the right corner in some ways it's a little bit like their 50 millimeter f 0.95 in that it doesn't feel like it's 100 percent resolving the corners now if we compare to f 2.8 on the right we can see in the center of the frame it has increased contrast a bit more mid frame is looking really fantastic and looking down into the corners we can see that that sharpness profile is extending further so this looks better obviously better contrast and we can see that we're starting to move this direction in terms of the resolution on at f4 and you can see it's you know getting further still f5.6 a little bit further though still not right down into that corner and even here at f8, we can see that the corner is never really 100% resolved. We'll pop over and look at the other side just to, you know, give it a fair shake. And uh, to be fair, you know, over here it's looking quite good. But again, you can see the same thing is really true. As you start to get towards the corner of the frame, that uh, resolution is dropping. Now, again, to be fair, I'm doing that test uh, and showing you at 200% magnification. So at 100% magnification and with a real world image, we can see that even on my 50 megapixel alpha one, we are getting a fabulously, fabulously detailed image out of this. And here's what really kind of blew my mind. Let's just pop out for a moment. And I want you to look at the lower left part of your screen. There's a little break in the trees there. And I only noticed this uh, when I was reviewing this image. But you can see that there is a gentleman here that is really quite high highly resolved that, you know, it just occupies what seems like a couple of pixels, but there's still plenty of resolution on there. But you can also see what we saw on the chart that when you go to that last little, uh, you know, percentage or two of the image, that's where the resolution drops off. And over here, it's a little bit harder to see because we don't have as much detail to resolve, but you can see again, it is starting to drop off right there at the very edge of the frame. Though, if we look more uh, mid frame here, it's looking still fine at that point. And up here, into you know the distance but i'm really quite impressed as i look throughout this image just how much detail is resolved you know in, in the sailboat off towards infinity there's a lot of information here in this image and so again for such an inexpensive lens that's a pretty impressive result
Now, looking at again at just 100%, this is one of those rare instances where using your minimum aperture, which I believe is f16 here, um, is actually going to produce a better result because now we can see resolution has reached right towards the corner. And so, again, at 100%, you know, other than that last little percentage, that really isn't looking too bad. And if I step back one to f11, it's going to be just slightly better still in terms of the overall contrast and resolution. So, again, a pretty decent result. Now, our up close performance is okay. Um, it's not great in terms of magnification, as you can see, uh, you know, somewhere probably only around 0.12 times or so. But we can also see that you've got a reasonably flat plane of focus. We've got really good detail and contrast in the center of the frame, uh, even at F2. And, uh, you know, as we move off towards the edges of the frame, you're going to start to lose a bit of that. But you know, it's only up in the, again, at the, in the corners where everything starts to fall apart. I use this lens as a walk around lens uh, for some street photography in beautiful Quebec City. And uh, you can see that under, you know, great conditions, you can produce really great looking uh, images, even with this ines inexpensive optic. And it is a nice discreet lens for doing some uh, kind of street type photography. And as you can see, I mean, you know, great looking results and uh, good color, more on color in just a moment. But obviously in beautiful settings, I was able to get beautiful color. And once again, as I've already noted, the amount of detail that you can actually capture, this is the uh, famous uh, Chateau Frontenac and you can see that um, I've got lots of detail captured on that but going to this type of shot which we've already looked at before you can see that their the color or the contrast doesn't really uh, kind of pop off the, the charts and there's something about it where it gives me a just a, a slightly almost uh, flattened tone curve that gives it a kind of a unique look when it comes to color. And so either you'll, you'll like it or not like it. But one thing that I certainly saw that is that in, you know, under good conditions and with beautiful scenes as this one certainly is, I mean, there's lots and lots of detail there. And there's something about the look of the lens that is interesting, um, almost like illustrative. And, uh, and so I don't know that I would, I certainly wouldn't give it top marks in terms of color accuracy or, you know, contrast, but I think that it delivers nice looking results. And you can see here in this uh, just kind of casual portrait that my wife took, I had to coach her a little bit on focus to get this shot, but you can see that the contrast, again, it doesn't pop off the charts, but it's, you know, enough to use as a portrait lens and the quality of the bouquet is not bad. Uh, here's one that I took, you know, kind of more of a street tight shot. And you can see that in this case, uh, I've gotten a lot better detail and better contrast. But part of that is the way that I've, you know, processed this image as well. And so it's all about, you know, how you approach a, the editing process. Here's one that I loved, you know, a lot of interesting colors going on in the image, but a street performer there in Quebec City, you know, just caught in that moment where he's he's really given it. And, and so anyway, uh, just an interesting shot. Again, a fun, inexpensive lens for street. Now, we've already noted that the amount of... Um, magnification is not great. However, you know, you can, even if you can't get super close, you can still blur out backgrounds, you know, depending on the setting. And you can see that the geometry is not bad from the lens. It's a, you know, pretty decent performance there. I just wanted to show this image for the fun of it. Uh, Chateau Frontenac at night with the blue hour during blue hour is a really amazing uh, subject. And, you know, once again, this lens did a great job, even with higher ISO here. I think this is 3200. Um, you can just see there's there's lots of great detail in the building itself. Now, we'll highlight a couple of other uh, flaws. And part of why I think you end up with that kind of unique low contrast look is if there is any kind of backlighting, you definitely get veiling in the image. And also, you can see here a little bit of a prismatic effect. It's almost a vintage lens quality. And, you know, here it's actually kind of cool. Uh, I think it's less cool here where I got a much more obvious ghosting pattern. And so you're going to, you know, obviously have to be careful with your composition. One final thing to look out for, and this is a night shot, and so it's not a star shot per se, but you can see as we move off towards the corner, this is not a lens you're going to want to use for shooting stars. A uh, coma gets really bad uh, towards the edge of the frame. So we started in that section asking the question, what do you get optically for 70 bucks? Well, the answer is you don't get a flawless optical performance, as we have seen, but for such a small, inexpensive op optic, you actually get a 
pretty decent optical performance. And I think that this is a lens that compares really favorably if you're comparing it to maybe buying a vintage lens uh, that, you know, kind of performs in a similar fashion. Both manual everything, no electronics. But in this case, you're getting a lot of that vintage charm. And I think some of that kind of illustrative look that isn't fully modern in its um, correction and performance. But a lens that really is a, a lot of fun and has the ability when stopped down to produce, I think, even more highly detailed uh, images than what you're going to be able to get out of most vintage glass. And so it's an interesting option for those of you that are looking for a really inexpensive lens for street, or maybe you've not really played with a manual focus lens much and you want to experiment with a 50 millimeter focal length. Well, this is an easy way to do so. And the fact that it mostly covers the full frame image circle. Doesn't ever quite resolve those corners perfectly, but uh, I think that it's a very intriguing option. And at the end of the day for 70 bucks, very low uh, risk, potentially very high reward. I'm Dustin Abbott, and if you look in the description down below, you can find buying links, linkage there to my, uh, my written review and image gallery. There's also linkage to follow myself or Craig on social media and to check out the Let the Light In channel. Uh, there's also uh, links there where you can get channel merchandise, become a patron, and help support this channel. And of course, if you haven't already, please click that subscribe button right here on YouTube. Thanks for watching. Have a great day, and let the light in.